Pray with me. Our great God, there is only one reason we could sing these words. That's your beautiful, glorious Son, our Lord Jesus the Christ, bled in our place, taking our sins upon himself that he might bear away our guilt, satisfy your wrath, Reconcile us to yourself and give us life. It is in these thoughts we revel, even as we open your word to these glorious truths this morning. Help us to hear and to see what you have for us in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning, Dan. Morning, Jake. Great to see both of you guys. Are we allowed to swarm you, or do we need to keep our distance? Okay. Keep, keep your distance. Jake says, bear hug Dan. <laughs> Dan gives a thumbs up. I don't know if I trust that. We know about Dan's pain tolerance. So glad to see you both here. I just want to piggyback a little bit on the announcement um, that Tom read this morning. Uh, about Scott and Kim, and um, just want to thank this church on behalf of Scott, on behalf of myself and all the elders, um, in terms of the way that you've cared for the Maxwells and cared for the elders during this time. Uh, you've expressed love and support and understanding and patience. I know uh, you, you love the Maxwells, you love this church, you've, you've waited to hear what's going on without a lot of asking questions. Hey, what's going on? I must know, I need to know. And um, there, just, there just has not been some of the typical kinds of things that can happen when there are difficulties in leadership in the church. And I'm just very, very thankful for you. And we, we should give thanks to God uh, because it, it really should be no surprise to any of us that one of the pastors at Grace Bible Church would take significant time to care for his own home. This is the very thing that Scott has discipled us in for a decade and a half, all of us, that we don't leapfrog over our hearts, we don't leapfrog over our homes to go do something out there in service of others. And, and so uh, the, the fact that, that you all have loved and supported the elders and loved and supported Scott in this is a demonstration of God's grace through Scott to all of us to disciple us in these very things. And so just uh, want to express gratitude to God and, and gratitude to you in this body for just being exemplary in that. Thank you. Also, uh, I feel, uh, there's too much to say about what I feel, Jumping into Romans 8.1, when Scott has so faithfully, carefully, excellently plowed tough ground to get us there, uh, it's hard. These are, these are big shoes to walk into, and I, I don't dare tread lightly on ground that has been so carefully, exegetically trod <laughs> for however many years Scott preached Romans 1-7. to I don't know if we're allowed to have favorites in the Bible. Many have chosen the book of Romans as a favorite. Uh, certainly is mine. And I don't know if we're ha allowed to have favorite chapters in a favorite book, but, but Romans 8 would be my favorite chapter in this favorite book. This is the chapter that begins with no condemnation and ends with no separation. It's no surprise that it has been called the brightest facet on the brightest gem in all of Scripture. The believer in Jesus Christ discovers here that he is not only not condemned, but is adopted, loved, and unchangeably so. In this chapter, we discover the active work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. 
We discover consolation for heaven's citizens who are still on earth, still afflicted by internal corruptions, who still will face external trials, the lingering sin of residual depravity, and the suffering of a frustrated world. We discover in here the assurance of salvation, a guarantee not backed by the FDIC, but by the eternal purpose, plan, and power of the triune God. We have in this chapter real hope in a cursed world, victory over every enemy, every trial, every obstacle, security in the love of God, active power over sin in the life of a Christian, and the personal experiential awareness of our relationship to the infinite God as our personal father. We have in this chapter help in prayer. And this chapter may help you actually determine whether or not you are a true Christian. This is a chapter worth memorizing. We're only going to study verse 1 today, and I think by the end of this sermon, you will have verse 1 memorized, and so you can go home this afternoon and begin your homework and begin memorizing Romans chapter 8. You will need it, and as an introduction to this really unbelievable chapter, I just want to read it in its entirety. So follow along as we hear God's word from Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, 
having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is what we have to look forward to. It begins in verse 1 with this radical statement, no condemnation. No condemnation. Paul says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This word condemnation is a judicial term. It, it is the verdict and the sentencing and the execution of the sentence. It's the official statement of guilt that a judge would make followed by the penalty that that guilt demands. To be condemned is to be declared guilty and sentenced to punishment. The execution of that punishment is inevitable, unavoidable, certain. Condemnation, this noun form of this word, is only used here and in Romans chapter 5. Turn back a couple of pages and notice the use of this word in Romans 5, 16, and 18. Paul says in Romans 5, 16, the gift, that is from Jesus Christ is not like that which came through the one who sinned. That's that which came through Adam. For on the one hand, judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. And then in verse 18, so then as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. The opposite of that is found in verse 18, condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. This idea of condemnation was universal for humanity. It came through our solidarity with Adam. Adam sinned, sin entered the world, spiritual and physical death spread to everyone, and everyone sinned, and everyone is condemned. This is the state into which we were born, the state in which we lived. We were swimming in condemnation. This is the condemnation from God due every human being because of sin. We are all guilty. 
And we have all lived under the sentence of death, like the sword of Damocles swinging back and forth over our necks because of what we've done. And this condemnation, the the sentence due our guilt, was the sentence of eternal death under the infinite wrath of God in hell. But now, Romans 8.1 brings this remarkable statement. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. And it is stated emphatically here. There's no verb. It, It simply says something like this. Condemnation, none. There are no degrees of condemnation. There's no one who is kind of condemned, sort of condemned, a little bit condemned, halfway condemned. There's no getting into condemnation and out of condemnation and back into condemnation and back out again. There's no back and forth when it comes to condemnation. This statement, this objective declaration of no condemnation means that the verdict is reversed. The guilty status is replaced by righteous status. The sentence is done away. There is no possibility of being punished for the crimes. Those in this category of no condemnation have been removed to a place where condemnation is not possible. Condemnation doesn't live there. No condemnation is really the logical outworking of justification, the the doctrine of justification by faith that Paul drew out for us beginning in Romans chapter 3, that we are put forward by God as just or as righteous. We are regarded by God as if we had never done anything wrong and as if we had always done everything right. We just read in Romans 8, 33 and 34, who could bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? You see, in the courtroom of God, when God declares one righteous, condemnation is impossible. When the judge of all judges and the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords in his courtroom has said, not guilty and perfectly righteous, no one can bring condemnation. Uncondemnable is the Christian's new status. How does one get from the status condemned to a place of no condemnation? Romans 8.1 is going to give us some clues. We're going to divide this up into three parts. And the first thing I want you to see in Romans 8.1 is the connection. The connection of this no condemnation status to everything that Paul has said before leading up to this point in the book of Romans. Uh, This is going to help us get caught back up to where we were. Romans 8.1 begins with the simple word, therefore. Therefore. This denotes an inference from what has gone before. Uh, There's been a long argument leading to this point, and this is the conclusion of that argument. You remember that Paul's letter to the church at Rome was a missionary support letter. Paul says in 115, I long to preach the gospel to you. Paul had never been to Rome. He wrote the letter to the Romans, which is really the gospel in letter form and sent it to them. And he still wanted to go be with them in person and preach the gospel to them again. And he says in chapter 15, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you Romans in passing and to be helped by you on my way there. In other words, Paul wanted to take the gospel to where it was not yet heard, and he wanted to go to Rome, having sent them the gospel in letter form, having preached the gospel to them personally, so that they might hear the gospel, rejoice in the gospel, and send Paul the missionary along so that he might preach the gospel where it had not yet been heard. This letter was Paul's introduction to the very concept of the Roman church sending him on his way in missionary enterprise. And so Paul explains the gospel for them in this letter. In chapter 1, and you can turn back there, we're going to survey through the book of Romans briefly. In Romans 1.16, we get the theme of this letter. Paul says, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you. Why? Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Not ashamed of the gospel. Paul, why are you not ashamed of the gospel? 
verse 16, for it, that is the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Gentile. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is God's power for salvation. Paul, why is it God's power for salvation? Verse 17, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, made known, manifested. Well, Paul, why do I need the righteousness of God to be manifested? Because verse 18, for the wrath of God is being revealed against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And what follows in verses 19 to the end of Romans chapter 1 is the description of the downward spiral of humanity in depravity. What is being revealed currently against sinful humanity is the wrath of God. And that wrath of God comes in a couple of forms, one of which is the judicial hardening that gives man over to greater sin. You say, I don't want to know the truth. I don't want to see or hear the truth. Uh, I, I don't want God. I want to run my own life. And God may give you what you're asking for, more blindness, more deafness, more darkness, more sin as judgment. And the wrath of God is being revealed in that way. Romans 2 will go on to tell us that the wrath of God is also being stored up for the day of his wrath. Jonathan Edwards tells us that uh, Romans 2, it, it paints the picture of God's mercy like a great dam holding back a giant body of water. And every time a human sins, he is throwing more water behind the dam. And when God's mercy stops and the dam breaks, more wrath is unleashed against humanity. Romans chapter 1 paints the picture of the Gentiles in their sin, in their downward spiral of depravity, separated from God, enemies of God, given to more sin. Of course, the Jews aren't off the hook. In chapter 2, Paul turns the tables and puts them in the crosshairs of God's judicial watch. God sees the religious, the moral, God sees those hanging on to the coattails of Judaistic culture, those who had Bibles and knew the truth, and, and God says, you're not exempt either. Just because you have this heritage and you have this book doesn't make you right before God. You need something more than that. In fact, your exposure to the truth brings you in greater danger of greater condemnation. You will not escape. And if it's not enough to say the Gentiles are in trouble in chapter 1 and the Jews are in trouble in chapter 2, Paul makes it very clear in chapter 3 and says, all y'all are in trouble, as if there were a third category. Listen to the litany of Old Testament texts urged upon us to seal the deal on human depravity. There is none righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands there is no one who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their tongues. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. The path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. testimony after testimony of the depravity of man, the hopeless condition of man. And one might think, well, if, if I can just get a hold of God's rules and keep them, then I can fix this problem. And Paul answers that in verse 19 of chapter 3. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under law so that every mouth may be closed and the whole world held accountable. You see, law didn't fix the problem. It just shut your mouth. It tells us what the standard is and shows us we're accountable to the standard. But verse 20, by works of law, that is by any human effort to keep the rules, no flesh will be justified or declared righteous, or put forth as righteous in God's sight. Why? Because through law comes knowledge of sin. And here we get back to the answer to the question, why is Paul not ashamed of the gospel? Why is it the power of God? Because in the gospel, the power of God, or the righteousness of God is manifested. Paul comes back to that here in 321, but now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. Manifested. 
The gospel's good news because you get God's righteousness. But you're not going to get it through rules. You're not going to get it through religion. You're not going to get it through law keeping. You're going to get it another way. How do we get that? Here's the gospel. And the gospel was witnessed to by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God. Here it is, verse 22. Through faith in Jesus the Messiah for all who believe. For there's no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which came through Christ Jesus. It's a mouthful. A free gift of God's grace to those who believe. How could God do that? Because verse 25, He displayed Jesus as a propitiation in His blood through faith. Propitiation, that great salvation word, a satisfaction of divine wrath by a substitute. That is, God put on display his son to absorb all the wrath of God against every sin that any believer would ever commit, past, present, and future, and eradicate God's wrath concerning that sin completely. Jesus Christ at the cross has made God propitious, that is, to look favorably upon the ungodly, the sinner, the enemy on the basis of a substitute, bearing that sin at the cross and being punished for it in full. So that the demands of justice are met and the sinner is freed. And not just acquitted, not just, hey, you're guilty, you get to go free, but declaration not guilty. Declaration, you're righteous, always done everything right. And why did God do it this way? Verse 26, for the demonstration of his righteousness. Remember, the gospel is good news because it is God's righteousness manifested. His righteousness even through the righteous one dying in the place of the unrighteous, which itself is wrong. And it's our only hope. It really is an abomination, as the writer writer of the Proverbs says. That the guilty gets punished, or the innocent gets punished, and the guilty go free? It's heinous, and it's our only hope. And God does it this way so that he could be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus, verse 26. The standards of justice are maintained, sin is punished in full, and the sinner goes free. This is the beauty and glory and mystery of the gospel. So that verse 4 of chapter 4, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but what is due. That's the religious man. God, I'm doing this for you and this for you and this for you. These five pillars, these good works, these sacraments, I'm doing these things to merit favor with you. Well, if that's how this worked, God would only give us what we earned but we know that all we've earned is death. The wages of sin is death. You've been punching in and out of that time clock your whole life, only turning in sin, and the only thing that's due you is the wrath of God. But to the one who does not work, verse five of chapter four, but believes, (laughs) believes in him who justifies the ungodly, declares righteous the ungodly who believes. (laughs) His faith is credited as righteousness. And then Paul in chapter 4 employs David and then Abraham to bolster this argument that justification or a declaration of a right standing before God only comes on the basis of faith and faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. This is the doctrine of justification by faith alone. That portion of Paul's argument comes to this glorious conclusion in chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified, we have peace with God. Staggering. We possess peace with God because God has declared the sinner righteous. And everything that follows are the fruits of justification. Peace with God, chapter 5, verse 1. Grace in which to stand, verse 2. Exaltation in hope, verse 2. Exaltation in trials, verse 3. The love of God, in verse 5 and following. No more wrath, verse 9. Reconciliation to God, in verse 10. And a new solidarity in chapter 5, verses 12 to 19. We had an old solidarity with Adam, 
And we have a new solidarity with Christ. In chapter 5, verse 20, we get a heading for the next two chapters that follow. Paul says in Romans 5, 20, law came in so that transgression would increase. It's counterintuitive. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that just as sin reigned, ruled a tyranny in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness unto eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5, 20 and 21 is the heading for the next two chapters that follow. It is the reign of grace. These are fruits of justification that fundamentally change your relationship to sin in chapter 6 and your relationship to law in chapter 7. You were a slave of sin and you were under law. What does the gospel do? Your union with Christ means a union with his death and death changes your relationship. The old slave master can't tell the dead slave what to do. You are dead in in respect of sin. You were alive to God. You were a slave of sin. Now you're a slave of righteousness. You belong to the gospel. And in chapter 7, we see this new relationship to the law. Slaves of sin are under law. But to be in Christ is to no longer be a slave of sin and no longer be under law. In other words, you're not looking for rules and regulations to try to make your way right with God. Can't be done. And as long as you're a slave of sin, as long as you're outside of Christ, law is all you have and law only condemns. It's a deadly combination to be a slave of sin and under law. You can't please God as a slave of sin. You can acknowledge that the law of God is good. You can even aspire to keep that law. But the law was never designed by God to fix your slavery to sin. It reveals the standard. It incites sin in us to break the standard. And then it condemns us for failing the standard. That's what law can do. And it's not the law's fault. The the law as it came from God was good, beautiful, perfect. That is Paul's point in Romans 7. He's trying to describe for us a, a defense of the good law of God, an indictment of sinful humanity. And as long as man is a slave of sin and under law, it only means condemnation and death. The aggravation of further sin, the breaking of the standard, and greater condemnation. In fact, Romans 7, 14 to 25 is probably a picture of the best that sinful man can do under the law. You think about Paul as a Pharisee, love the law of God and could not do what it says. Look at 7, 14. I know that the law is spiritual, but I am fleshy. Romans 8 is going to tell us that if you're fleshy, you're not a Christian. And we'll get there. And he says, I'm sold into bondage to sin. Romans 6 told us if you're a slave of sin, you're not a Christian. So what follows in 14 to 25 is is Paul's picture of the best that a man can do as a slave of sin under the law. And where does it end up? Wretched man that I am. Who will set me free? Now this leads us to Romans 8. Freedom in Christ. Freedom in the Spirit. Life. Romans 8 picks up on the thought that Paul gave us back in chapter 7, specifically verses 4 to 6. Look back there with me. Paul says in chapter 7, verse 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to Jesus, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that you might bear fruit for God. You couldn't bear fruit for God under the law as a slave to sin, but you can bear fruit for God united to Christ. For while we were in the flesh, there it is again, this flesh category is one who is under law and a slave of sin. The sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now, verse 6, we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, (laughs) 
so that we might serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. And if you were to go to, from Romans chapter 7, verse 6 to Romans 8, 1, it flows magnificently. This is the life of newness in the spirit beginning in Romans 8, 1. Why the digression in the rest of chapter 7? Paul needed to defend the law. God gave the law. It was good. It was God's self-disclosure. It was right for God to give a standard. It was right for God to show man his helplessness. There are many reasons for the law's existence. The law is good. Man is bad. And you need a solution outside the law in order to live a life pleasing to God. That is the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a redeemed believer, purchased, paid for by Christ, indwelt, fruit-bearing by the Holy Spirit. That brings us to Romans chapter 8. It's a continuation of the fruits of justification by faith alone. We have a new relationship to God, united to Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. We have a new status, a new identity, new abilities, new desires, new life, power over sin, adoption, inheritance, hope, help, victory. All of that is in Romans 8. Christian, you are also uncondemnable uncondemnable for your sins and inseparable from God's love. That leads us to the contrast we need to see here in Romans 8.1. The contrast. We've seen the connection to what went before. There's also a contrast, and it's found in this little word, now. There is, therefore, now no condemnation. What is the corollary to that? Well, There was condemnation then, before. Now implies that there was condemnation previously. And this is exactly what we saw in the other two uses of this word condemnation in Romans 5, 16, and 18. Our union with Adam, our solidarity with Adam, meant that we were all sinners living in spiritual death and being condemned for our crimes. Now, this is similar to other statements Uh, other uses of this word now. Now is one of these watershed words that sort of paints a before and after picture of the Christian life. What was your life like before you were a Christian? And what is your life like after salvation? I'll sum up just a few of these in Romans chapter 5, 8, and 9. Before you were categorically sinners, now categorically justified. Romans 5, 10, and 11 Before, you were enemies. Now, you are reconciled. In 619, you used to present yourselves daily for sin when sin was your master. Now, you are slaves to righteousness. In 621 and 22, you were receiving no benefit from your shameful activities back then. But now, sanctification and eternal life are your benefits. In chapter 7, verses 5 and 6, you were in the flesh, aggravated by the law. You were bearing fruit for death, but now released from the law, serving in the Spirit. This little word now shows us the contrast between who you were and who you are. A new status, new identity, constituted righteous, at peace with God, alive by the Spirit. You have new abilities. A whole new category of being is the Christian. In chapter 5, verse 6, we were said to be helpless in our ungodliness. In 5, 8, we were sinners. In 5, 10, we were enemies. Chapter 6, we were slaves of sin, under the law, dead, headed for eternal death. This categorical change affects a new status. And you cannot get to uncondemnable status by your own effort. That leads us to our third point in our outline this morning, the condition. This no condemnation clause comes with a condition. You must be in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The believer in Jesus Christ is indeed uncondemnable. 
All that was condemnable in you was condemned already in Jesus Christ. The corollary truth of this statement is that the one who is not in Christ is condemned. Stands condemned already. Listen to John 3.18. He who believes in him, that is in Jesus, is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And John 3.36, he who believes in the Son possesses eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. If you're outside of Jesus Christ, your identity hasn't been changed, your status hasn't been changed, you're left with the ability, the priorities, the passions, the desires, the status, and the identity that you had from birth in Adam. And the coming of Jesus to the earth was not enough. Listen, I think we get mistaken around Christmas time. We all start singing these songs in the mall. Oh, Jesus came. Our sins are forgiven because he came. It's not true. The coming of Jesus was not enough to eradicate the condemned status of humanity. Listen to Jesus' own words in John 3, 19 and 20. This is the judgment. Light has come into the world, speaking about himself. But men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. It's not enough that Jesus came. The incarnation does not solve man's problem. In fact, the incarnation brings about greater condemnation because men saw the light and rejected it and scurried away from it to all their dark little corners to protect their sin. The miracles of Jesus are not enough to put away condemnation. Think about all the things that Jesus did while he was on the earth and, and all the people that saw the things that he did. Matthew eleven twenty two, 22, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Listen, being close to Jesus and seeing Jesus do miraculous things, even believing that he did those things, isn't enough to assuage God's wrath. It's not enough to remove you from condemnation. In fact, just the opposite. It puts you under liability of greater condemnation. And the teachings of Jesus are not enough. It's not enough to sit on the hill and listen to Jesus deliver the Sermon on the Mount. It's not enough to own a Bible. It's not enough to listen to Jesus' stories. Many people heard Jesus' teachings firsthand and were condemned. Many people today hear Jesus' teachings and are still condemned. Luke 12, 48, the one who heard and was given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. Jesus is speaking about degrees of punishment in hell. Greater punishment for those who heard the teachings of Jesus and are still under the condemnation of God. It's not enough that Jesus came to the earth. It's not enough that Jesus did miracles. It's not enough that Jesus taught things. It's not enough that any of us are exposed to any of those things. One must be in Christ Jesus. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. The testimony is this. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. 1 John 2, 2 tells us that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. That is, only the death of Jesus in the place of sinners, appropriated by faith alone, can move us from condemnable to uncondemnable. No matter how far down the road of sin you have gone, no matter how bad you think you are, it's actually worse than you think. You cannot out -sin the merits of the work of Christ for Jesus the Christ to be the propitiation for our sins before God means that he actually pays for every one of them for all who believe. 
And you can't out sin that work. You can't bring about a condemnation that Jesus Christ removes. If you are in him, this uncondemnable status was actually purchased. The death of Christ on the cross was not just an idea that God sort of looks at and says, okay, I'll wink at sin. No, it's actual judicial payment for crimes. There's a mathematical computation between crimes committed, justice poured out, penalty paid. Think through what this means for us. Do you ever feel condemned? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that is a distrustable feeling. It's not true. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No matter how you feel about it, this is an objective truth that is outside of you. It's just like Romans 5.1. We are justified, and having been justified, we possess peace with God. I feel like God's angry at me. Well, you have peace with God. Objective truth outside of you. You're not condemned. There is no condemnation. Condemnation has no place in you if you're in Christ Jesus. And it doesn't matter how you feel. That is an objective reality outside of you. You're not a slave of sin. You are alive in Christ. These truth statements, these objective realities, judicial declarations by God for us in the gospel declared in the book of Romans. Do not depend on how you feel about them. Do you ever feel like someone is condemning you? Oh, you're condemning me. No one can do that. No one can condemn you. If you're in Jesus Christ, God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Not Satan, not his demons, not your circumstance, not your sin, not you, not anybody else. There's no condemnation. Only one person can condemn God. And if God justifies, no one condemns. I think we use this word condemn wrong sometimes. We like to say, oh, you're condemning me when someone's preaching the gospel to us. (laughs) I don't have that power. I don't have that ability to condemn anyone. I'm trying to present to you life. I'm trying to tell you that there's a cliff you're driving toward, and if you keep driving, you're going to go off that cliff, and it's eternal destruction. You're condemning me. I'm not condemning you. You're already on the road to condemnation, and it's not me doing the condemning. I want you to know there's life and hope in front of you if you will only turn to Jesus Christ. I was condemned, and I'm now uncondemnable. You can be uncondemnable. Turn to Jesus. Gospel proclamation is not condemnation. Sometimes we, we use this word wrong with each other. Stop condemning me. Uh, we're using the wrong word. I, I might try to use that word if I'm feeling convicted about my sin. Or I don't like it when somebody is addressing something wrong in my life. In closing this morning, I want to think through some categories, common categories for the Christian life that are not condemnation. And it only makes sense. Romans 8.1 is very clear. If you're in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation. So if there are other categories of things that shape the Christian life, guess what they're not? Condemnation. (laughs) Okay, here's a short list. Consequences of sin are not condemnation. Consequences for my sin are not condemnation. If I don't tie my shoes in the morning and I trip over them... (laughs) It's a consequence. Galatians 6, 7 is clear. We are like farmers. 
and we sow seeds in the ground, and those seeds grow up. And the kinds of seeds we put into the ground are the kinds of seeds that grow up. There's a reaping and sowing principle. I'm sowing seeds of sin in the ground. Guess what's going to grow? The consequences of my sin are not condemnation. Second category, admonition is not condemnation. In other words, someone needs to address something in your life. They love you enough to actually point it out. It's not condemnation. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 3. He, he, he's writing correction to the whole church at Corinth. And he says, I do not speak to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and, and to live together. In other words, Paul's writing this letter of correction to the, to the church. It's not condemnation. Someone pointing out sin in your life, it's not condemnation. Discipline from God, a third category, is not condemnation. Hebrews 12, 6 makes it clear that if God is disciplining you, he does so because he's a loving father. God disciplines those he loves. Discipline from the Lord is actual proof of your adoption. It's not condemnation. The refinement of trials is not condemnation. James 1 tells us that God designs them for our completion in Christ. You want to grow in Christ? How do you get maturity in Christ? Well, you have to let endurance have its perfect work. Where do I get endurance? Oh, from various trials. Oh, therefore, have joy, my brethren, when you face various trials. This is God's plan for the refinement of faith. It's not condemnation. Confession of sin is not condemnation, 1 John 2, 8 and 9. Repentance from sin is not condemnation. The Matthew 18 process is not condemnation. Now, it might reveal the true spiritual nature of one who does not repent. But it is a process of discovery. It is not condemnation. And then the judgment seat of Christ yet to come for believers is not condemnation. This is the bema seat, theologians will call it it from the Greek word bema. It just means a, a throne where Christ will judge. And this is the judgment of reward for believers in this life. 2 Corinthians 5.10, 1 Corinthians 3, both describe this judgment of Christ. Listen, all your sins have been paid for, Christian. They have been removed as far as the east is from the west. They are done away with. There is no condemnation. At the Bema Seat Judgment, might you lose reward that you could have had if you had lived more faithfully, if you had built with precious stones and silver and gold rather than the wood, hay, and straw? Yeah, yeah. And you'll suffer loss of the reward that God would have produced in you had you more faithfully walked in the good works that he'd prepared for you, Ephesians 2.10. That judgment seat is not condemnatory. It is a judgment seat of reward. Some for greater reward and some for lesser reward, all for reward. Listen, a Christian can and will sin, will grieve the Holy Spirit, will have a burdened conscience, conviction, sorrow, even discipline from the Lord at times. We will need to be admonished, rebuked at times, ashamed, but never, never, never condemned. What God takes away no one of us can ever put back. Condemnation is just the opposite of justification. Once God has justified the ungodly, that enemy now becomes a beloved son and is forever uncondemnable. All of this is the result of the reign of grace in the life of a believer. You were born under the tyranny of sin, Romans 5.21, just as sin reigned, ruled, terrorized in death, so now grace reigns through righteousness to eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what great truths, too much for us. Too good to be true and yet true. We bank on these things. We want to tell our feelings to give up and surrender to objective truths from your word.
God, we look forward to the unfolding of this reign of grace and the fruits of justification and this new life in the Spirit. Give us help in all these things. May we go from here ever rejoicing in the finished work of your Son. It's in his name we pray.